Oral questions, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Acting Premier. Why throughout the entire election campaign did the Premier not once talk about his plan to rip up Toronto's wards, cancel regional elections, and take power away from millions of voters? Deputy Premier. Thank you. To the uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, through you to the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I think uh, our government for the people was very clear Absolutely. during the election uh, that Crystal. resulted uh, in us becoming uh, the government of Ontario. We made it very clear, and our Premier made it very clear, that we were going to respect taxpayers' dollars, that we were going to work to see to reduce the size and cost of government. Right. We believe very strongly that our good local uh, government act uh, will provide that for the citizens of Toronto by streamlining their council, by having 25 members of council. Uh, we believe that, uh, that having them use the same uh, jurisdictions that uh, their federal MPs and their uh, provincial MPPs use is, is good. And I, and I believe Response. that having a streamlined government will make d quicker decisions, and those 25 members will be able to focus on the priorities for the citizens of Toronto. I believe that it is good public policy. Supplementary. Speak, speaker, the people of Ontario care about their local democracy. They care about their local democracy. Long-time Conservative voters care about their local democracy. They're passionate about, about defending the autonomy and independence of Ontario's municipalities. Respect for the rights of voters is something that unites Ontarians across political stripes and across our vast geography. So why is the Premier showing so much disrespect for people who want to have a say in how their city is run? Well, again, Speaker, uh, through you to the Leader of the Opposition, again, I, I believe our party was very clear. Our Premier was crystal, crystal clear. clear during the election that we are not only going to respect taxpayers' dollars, Absolutely. but we will always try to look to see how we can be more efficient how local government can provide more effective programming to their citizens. This is exactly to the core of the bill that is on the order paper in my name, Speaker. We believe very strongly that a council of 25 will be able to provide those streamlined, quick decisions that will be able to deal with the priorities of the citizens of Toronto. There will be no more gridlock on council after that bill is passed, Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, every Canadian cares deeply about our democracy. Every Canadian. No matter what our differences, all Ontarians believe that people should decide how they are governed. That's why this Premier's behaviour is so shocking. By bullying his way into municipal elections, ripping up Toronto's wards, and cancelling regional chair elections, he is showing zero respect for Ontarians. Why is this Premier abusing the powers of his office to deny voters the respect that they deserve? Again, Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Opposition, this proposal, this proposed bill, Again, we'll, we'll make Toronto Council more efficient, and as a result, we'll save them, over the course of the four-year term, $25 million. Again, it just speaks to what we talked about during the campaign, the fact that uh, we want a, a smaller government. We want to be able to respect taxpayers' dollars. And, and I disagree, Speaker, fundamentally with the conversation about democracy. I, I want to remind leader the, the leader of the opposition that as of 8 a.m., the Toronto Star Reader poll shows that 69 per cent of people that responded say that our proposals will save money and will be good for democracy. Restart the clock. Next question is also for the acting premier uh, but of course it's not about the numbers it's about how you get to change and democracy demands that people are involved in the change speaker that's the problem 
The Premier of this incredible province should be supporting and cultivating local democracy. He should be doing everything he can to encourage new and diverse voices uh, to come to the table and shape the future of all of our communities. But instead of doing the right thing, this Premier is undermining our democracy. He's trying to infer, interfere in Toronto's election so he can control the city from the Premier's office. Why is the Premier taking the power out of the hands of the people and putting more power in his own hands? Uh, again, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for uh, the question. Uh, our, our government is committed to putting accountability and trust back into government. It should come as no surprise to Ontarians that we talked over and over in the campaign about reducing the size and cost of government, about making government, no matter what level, whether it be our level or local government, more efficient and more effective. We believe on this side of the House that our member municipalities provide vital services to their constituents very, very important services for their constituents, and I believe that it's in all of our interest to ensure that they do it in a way that's most efficient and respects that taxpayer. Again, I believe that uh, the components of our bill that are before the House, that if it's Bonds. passed, will make sure we have better local government. And I, again, ask that the Leader of the Opposition consider changing her tack and supporting our supplementary. Well, I, I would suggest that the minister not hold his breath, Speaker, because I believe in protecting and upholding democratic processes. To that end, Speaker, running an entire election campaign with a hidden agenda is fundamentally at odds with our democracy. Right. Cancelling elections is at odds with who we are as Ontarians. And ripping up Toronto's wards after years of public consultation is nothing more than a petty act of a man taking revenge on people that he disagrees with. It is not the behaviour of a Premier. It is the behaviour of a bully. Why is the Premier imposing his own hidden agenda on the people of Ontario and refusing to to act like a leader. Response. Again, uh, Speaker, through you to the Leader of the, of the Opposition. An oversized council makes it almost impossible to make those streamlined decisions that are in uh, tr Torontonians' best interest. We believe that, uh, that the only way to provide that meaningful consensus is to have a situation where, in, in this city, you would have 25 federal MPs uh, representing a constituency, the same constituency that has 25 MPPs presently, and now the, the bill would have those same 25 city councillors in that same constituency. Having a streamlined council that on October 22nd can make those quick decisions, can fulfill those priorities of the citizens of this city. I think that Spons. is the way to go. It should, again, come as no surprise. We talked over and over and over again, Speaker, about making sure that taxpayers' dollars are respected. Uh, again, small. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Look, the Premier's assault on de local democracy won't help anyone but the Premier, and it will make it harder for the citizens of Toronto to get the services and supports that they need. This plot is all about take the Premier taking revenge on his opponents. It's all about the Premier controlling City Council from the Premier's office. And as Councillor Mammoliti said, it's all about purging progressives off Council and helping right wingers take control of Toronto. So, why is the Premier hiding behind bluster and distraction when Order. he should have the courage to tell the people exactly what it is that he's up to? Response. Again, Speaker, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Uh, you know, our proposed legislation will not only solve uh, a problem with the municipal government, the fact that they're so tied up in gridlock in their decision-making process. It also, as I said uh, in this House before, the issue of voter parity. So the, exactly. the member opposite uh, wants to quote a, a councillor. I'll, I'll quote one as well. Councillor Just, uh, Justin uh, DiCiano had some excellent remarks uh, on the subject on Friday at a press conference where he said, and I quote, the ridings do not belong to the councillors. They belong to Torontonians. There is a massive improvement 
over a million Torontonians who will now have a fair vote because of the decision made this morning. That's his quote. I think again, Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Opposition, there are many councillors, there is a large constituency out Rolling. there that believes that having a smaller, more Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. The next question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. For 20 years, people across Ontario have been fighting to fix the damage that the last Conservative government did to social assistance. And now, instead of fixing the problems and helping everyone live with dignity, this minister is making the problems even worse. The Conservatives are slashing the planned social assistance increase by half and denying the people uh, the raises that they were promised. Why is this minister cutting social assistance in a callous attempt to save money on the backs of the most vulnerable? Children, community, and um, I thank the uh, leader of the official opposition for a question. I disagree with the premise. Uh, we are, uh, we have been very clear. Uh, we have inherited a patchwork system that is uh, dysfunctional, um, that is uh, in a mess. And so, what we have said is we are going to have a 1.5 percent increase in social assistance rates in ODSP and Ontario Works across the board as we hit pause on the irresponsible plan put forward by the previous Liberal government. And what we have said is that we will have action in 100 days so we can lift more people up and get them back into the workforce where that's possible and provide them with the necessary support that they so desperately need. We will lead this process with compassion and we will ensure that we have better outcomes for the people that we represent across all of Ontario. I look forward Once. to your supplementary question so I can talk a little bit more about our plan. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, by slashing social assistance increases and cancelling the basic income pilot, the minister is punishing people and pushing them into deeper poverty. The Income Security Advocacy Centre says that the Premier's cut will steal $150 million out of the hands of the poorest people in our province. They say that there is absolutely nothing compassionate about what this minister is doing, and I completely agree with income security advocates across Ontario who are appalled and incredibly disappointed. How can this minister stand here and do the dirty work of a premier who's attacking the most vulnerable people in Ontario? Minister. The leader of the official opposition would rather us continue to pile on to a very broken system that is disadvantaging many people. Her and I spent many years in the, in the opposition together in many questions with, and, and many committees with the Auditor General, but let me be very clear. I had a good meeting on Sunday and an even better one on Monday with the Auditor General, and the Auditor General told me that Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Supports have lots of uh, challenges. In fact, the previous administration refused to implement some of those, uh, pro uh, th those uh, recommendations that would have improved the system for better outcomes for people. So we're going to act expeditiously. I've given my ministry 100 days as we hit the pause button and under compassionate grounds have, uh, have asked and, and received from the cabinet 1.5 percent increase for all those folks in social assistance. We're going to get more people back on, on track. We're going to lift them up and we're going to start with compassion. But I really reject the dog with Thank you. Stop the clock. I ask the Minister of Children and Community Services to withdraw the unparliamentary remark. Mr. Speaker. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Mississauga East Cooksville. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was deeply disappointed by the actions of one of the members of the offi official opposition in this House. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people includes members from diverse races, faiths, and backgrounds. The government has chosen to honor the people of Ontario by continuing House proceedings today. 
I am proud to stand here today and state that our government for the people will not tolerate hate or racism of any kind, and it has no place within this legislature. As the minister, minister responsible for the Anti-Racism Directorate, could the minister please explain the position of this government on hate and racism in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from uh, Mississauga East Cooksville for the important question that he just uh, gave me. And I'd also like to congratulate the member on his election to the legislature. Mr. Speaker, as the member stated, our government is for the people, and it includes every person in this great province. I was absolutely shocked and disgusted by the comments made by the member of the official opposition in this legislature during yesterday's question period. Ontario is an inclusive province where all are respected, no matter their background, nationality, faith, or race. As a second-generation Canadian, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the charge that he made. You didn't name anybody. Withdraw. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, yes. Withdraw. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response to this important topic. I feel proud knowing that our government for the people is taking the initiative to combat hate and racism within this province, and to know that this government is committed to taking hate and racism seriously. It is without question that our government for the people will not tolerate hate and will be sure to remain committed to our priorities of listening and serving all of the great people of this province. Mr. Speaker, given the extremely inappropriate remarks made yesterday by a member of this legislature, and ask the member to withdraw. Could the minister please explain how he's combating racism and hate within this great province? Start the clock. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for this important question. I want to ensure all members of this House that my ministry is responsible for overseeing the anti-racism directorate. It's continuing to fulfill its mandate, and it's working on the basis of a whole-of-government approach to addressing systemic racism. Anti-racism is a proactive process of removing systemic barriers that seek to identify, remedy, and prevent racial inequities. It is an investment in human capital and the province's economic future. Our goal is to ensure opportunities are available to everyone, creating a healthier society and a stronger economy, a better Ontario for all. Again, Mr. Speaker, there is simply no place for hate in Ontario Response. or in the walls of this legislature, and our government for the people will continue taking this important issue seriously. Thank you. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Just the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yesterday, the Conservative government announced that they were slashing already meager social assistance rates for people living in poverty and those with disabilities. This mean-spirited and callous decision unfairly targets the most vulnerable members of our communities. It lacks compassion empathy, and shows a complete disdain for people living in poverty. We know there are problems with the system and how it functions, but it should be obvious to everyone that slashing rate increases in half is simply not how you help vulnerable people. Speaker, does the minister really believe that people receiving social assistance will be better off with a cut to their already below poverty level income? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. Um, I will note that we are actually moving forward with a 1.5 percent increase across the board for o o ODSP and Ontario Works. Uh, we have made that decision on compassionate grounds as we hit the pause button on a previous plan put forward by the Liberal government, which was uh, which was unsustainable. It was a mess. It was disjointed. It was patchwork. We could have cherry-picked certain things, but I think that would have been irresponsible because we would have been building on top of an already broken system. So what we have said uh, it, it, is we are going to set ourselves up for success by putting forward a plan in the next 100 days, and we will come back to the people of Ontario with a plan that will lift people up, that will bring back dignity to the system, that will ensure people can get back to work where they can and where they can, that they have a strong, Spons. sustainable social safety net for themselves. So I look forward to the supplemental. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. The minister said yesterday that they need 100 days to figure out the system and set it right. But the studies have been done and the results are already in. Over a year's worth of work went into producing the Income Security Roadmap for Change report, which was submitted to the government last fall. In it, the working groups laid out substantial recommendations for Ontario's income security system, including a rate increase of 5 per cent a year. Speaker, I have a copy of the report. I'm happy to send it to the minister so she can familiarize herself with it. Speaker, will the minister call off her redundant 100-day fishing expedition and accept the results of the roadmap for change? Minister, Speaker, the short answer, obviously, is no. It wasn't working. The system wasn't working under the previous Liberal administration. It was dysfunctional. It's a mess. I, I, the first days I was the minister responsible, uh, I, I had massive briefings because I inherited five ministries. And did you know, Speaker, that social assistance and poverty reduction and, and other ways to help people were, were spread over a number of different ministries rather than, uh, than, than be repatriated into one area. As a result, in basic income pilot project, people weren't speaking with the poverty reduction people, weren't speaking with the social assistance people. I think I owe it to Ontarians, this government owes it on, to Ontarians, to make sure that we're speaking to everybody within these various departments to put forward a sustainable plan to help people get back on Response. track. And that's what we're going to do in the next 100 days. Order. Order. We can restart the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services with responsibility for immigration and women's issues. Minister, as I listened to your announcement from yesterday afternoon, and reviewed your news release to learn more about the Ontario Social Safety Net, our social assistance programs, and in particular the Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program. For I, was dismayed, I was dismayed by the current situation with real growth in the number of longer-term recipients. The fact that the growth in the social assistance caseload has been greater than the rate of population growth over the last 15 years. I was also quite disappointed to hear that there is real growth in the number of people who are Ontario Works for more than five years. I had believed that Ontario Works is a short-term helping hand program. How can Question. this be true if recipients are on the program for more than five years? I have also come to learn that of those that get themselves off the program... Thank you. Thank you. Response, the Minister of Children and Community Affairs. Honourable Member for the question. Um, as I indicated, one of the first things that I did when I became the new minister responsible for social services was to review the social assistance uh, program that our government inherited, inherited. and this is, this is what we found. And, and, and I, I must be clear, this is not a, a fun job. This is a tough job, but we need to make sure we have right outcomes for people. And I'm just going to read you a few things. One in five people stay on Ontario Works for more than five years. That's not fair to the people who really would prefer to have a job, which is the best social program. The number of single people using the program grew by 57% in the last 15 years. 
There's a cycle of poverty that we have to get people out of in this province. That's the right thing to do. When people leave the program, almost half of them return, 90 per cent in the first year alone. That's Response. not fair to people in need, and that's why we're going to set a target of the next 100 days to get people back on track in this province. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister, for that response. I do feel better knowing that this government is focused on solutions and that this government is focused on objectives. Certainly, we should measure compassion by the outcomes and the motivation rather than measuring them in dollars and cents. I also appreciate that you have been quite forthright about the speed with which you will develop a plan for the future. I understand from your announcement and news release that the social assistance plan that coordinates the many programs you now oversee in the new ministry, and uh, it, of course in children, community and social services, is your key focus. I also understand that you would rather frontline staff spend time helping stabilize recipients and helping recipients to see a path to success rather than spending their time on paperwork. Minister, do you feel the Liberal social assistance programs are trapping too many people in the cycle of dependence? Minister, can you please tell this House about the plan you and your officials sure. are working on? Thank you. Response? It was actually a very important question as somebody who grew up in a very small rural town in Nova Scotia. Um, I, I saw the effects of poverty, and I, I saw the effects of a good job and what that brought to, to dignity to people, and that's certainly where we want to start. So what we're going to do with our 100-day plan is have equal measures of head and heart. We're going to lead with compassion, and we're going to lead with objectives to get more people back on, uh, back on track and, and helping them get sorted out. But I want to address one of the points that uh, my colleague mentioned about the administration. My staff in the field, and I was able to go and, and visit many of my staff in Ottawa, are, are, work, are, are spending between 75 and 90 percent of their time on administration rather than setting people up for life skills and mentoring them. Speaker, if we want to talk about compassion, we actually have to lead with compassion and make sure we treat people with dignity Bonds. and respect and give them a path forward, not like what the previous Liberal administration did in, in making sure they were stuck in poverty. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. The youth of Ontario, many of whom actually went through public education system with the outdated, out of touch 1998 curriculum, are demanding the 2015 curriculum be back in classrooms, Minister. Listen to their voices. They are calling to put a stop to this regressive and dangerous move. They won't settle for you not answering their questions. And they know. Sorry to interrupt, but I would ask again that the members make their questions through the chair. And they know this government's mythical 2014 curriculum does not exist. Will the minister finally listen to and respect students of Ontario who are telling this government that the 1998 curriculum is not enough to keep them safe from homophobia, transphobia, gender-based violence, sexual assault, and appearance-based bullying in the classroom and online. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I would like to say to the member opposite, I was very pleased to see her join us in Ottawa last week as she participated in the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarian Conference and as well as the CPA Conference as well. I really appreciated that you were there and you raised your voice very well. Thank you. And with regards to how we're moving forward in the fall, Speaker, I have to impress upon everyone that we've made our position very clear. Teachers will be using the curriculum last used in 2014. And to the member opposite, I would like to say, please work with me and ensure that the students that you spoke of have raised their voices and participate in the fulsome consultation that we will be hosting this fall. That is where they will have a forum to share how they feel and what they feel are important to pursue in terms of paths forward. Lawrence. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. 
Minister, students need. Through you, Mr. Speaker, our students need consultation. September is too late. Students will already be back in class. Teachers will be left without a curriculum framework that has any relevance to the world kids live in today. Parents in Toronto St. Paul's tell me they just cannot do this work alone. They need teachers to be equipped with the modernized 2015 curriculum. Will this government engage with Ontario's youth, or are they only interested in consulting with their right-winged extremist friends? Minister of Education. Thank you Morning, very much, Colin. Mr. Speaker. And Morning, I have to share with you that we're going to be engaging with every single person that wants to be heard with regards to the path we're going to pursue as we move forward. And until then, we are going to use the curriculum that was last used in 2014. And, Speaker, I have to share with you that I can't wait to, to kick off this consultation. And I invite every member in this House to join me mm -hmm. so that we have a fulsome consultation that enables every single person, be it an, a student, be it a parent, be it a teacher, be it a concerned community member, because we are committed to this consultation, Speaker, and I have to remind everyone in this House that the premise of this is because we had a former Liberal government that totally ignored Response. the concerns of parents. And just like the federal NDP leader said, we're going to respect our here, parents here. and consult with them and everyone that. else. Thank you very much. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Guelph. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Conservative economist Milton Friedman was an early promoter of a basic income guarantee because he felt it was a small government, non-bureaucratic solution to eliminate poverty. Former Conservative Senator Hugh Siegel designed the basic income guarantee policy to promote fairness and to help eliminate poverty. During the last election campaign, a Conservative spokesperson said the PC government would continue the basic income pilot. I participated in a debate with the Deputy Premier. She confirmed that the pilot would continue. Yet yesterday, the minister announced that the basic income pilot would be cancelled. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, why did your party make a promise to keep the basic income pilot during the campaign and break your promise yesterday? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the member of the Green Party, the uh, leader. It's a pleasure to take a question from you and welcome to your historic win here in the House. This is my first opportunity uh, to say that. Uh, look, this ministry is about making some tough decisions because we've been left with some very difficult challenges. We uh, immediately after being uh, selected as the minister responsible, um, I looked at the research project as a model and I was informed by many of my ministry that uh, that this kind of program really does not support the people becoming independent contributors to the economy, to their families, and uh, to the community. We need a system that is not only cost-effective, but incentivizes Official people to get back to, to work. And when it incentivizes them, we need to make sure that they are not penalized for income inequality. So uh, we, uh, we, have, we would rather right now invest in building a system of social services that, uh, that is more affordable for the province, but Response. also more successful for those who require uh, support. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, thank you for the kind words welcoming me to the legislature uh, and, and into your old office. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I agree that Ontario's social assistance system is broken. This is exactly why we need a basic income guarantee pilot to study how to fix the system. Right. Numerous yes. economists from across the political spectrum, okay. left, right, center, have all agreed that a basic income pilot is an effective way to create a small government solution to solving poverty. So through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, can you provide an economic analysis detailing why the ministry decided that the basic income pilot was not effective and share that with members of the legislature? 
Minister, response. I, I thank the, the honourable uh, member for his question. Look, our government will be doing a line-by-line -line audit uh, that will be made available in due course. But let's get back to the point. Uh, we, in the early days of this government, found that we had a, a patchwork, a dysfunctional system to eradicate poverty in Ontario, which social assistance and basic income should be part of. So we made, we made a tough decision. A decision that is going to be right for the people, but it was a difficult decision to make. So, over the next 100 days, we are going to develop an affordable, responsible plan to help people that are on the basic income pilot project to get back to work, to get back to school, to find themselves an opportunity to lift themselves up out of the cycle of poverty we've seen over the past 15 years. I would point out that, as somebody who has raised tens of thousands of pounds of food for food cupboards in my home community, there is a greater Response. reliance today on people using food. Food banks. There's a greater reliance of people needing affordable housing. There's a greater reliance of people that need homeless shelters, and that's a result of 15 years of mismanagement. Stop the call. Next question. We start the clock. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. During the election, Ontarian families spoke out against cap-and-trade. Ontario businesses spoke out against cap-and-trade, and this government listened. The former Liberal government made Ontario closed for business with this punitive tax and many other measures. However, last week, the minister introduced Bill 4, an act to wind down the cap-and-trade program. Our approach is different, Mr. Speaker. Our approach is an approach based on what's in the best interest of Ontario families and businesses. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of the Environment let Ontario families and businesses know what kind of relief they can expect for government? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Through, thank you, the member. Through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. I appreciate the question. While the federal government continues with their plan to impose a job-killing carbon tax, we here in this legislature, this side of the legislature, have been clear that Ontario will proceed with a plan to cut taxes, create jobs, and encourage growth. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we began debate on Bill 4, the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act, which will put an end to the carbon tax era in Ontario. And I'd like to thank the member from Barrie Innisville and from Cambridge for standing up for their constituents and speaking in favour of the bill. Here, here, here. I see her seating has improved, no doubt, as a result of her speech. <laughs> they, they understand that the legislation will like, make life more affordable for all Ontarians. This legislation includes a real commitment to a Made in Ontario environmental plan that will tackle climate change, but not through a regressive job-killing tax. Bonds. Furthermore, we'll create 8,000 jobs through this plan and save Ontario families $260 each and every year. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Minister for his answer. Thank you for listening to the people. Minister, promise made, promise, promise kept. I know. I know that after years of unkept promises, years of false promises, it truly offends the sensibilities of the members opposite to see this government delivering not on their agenda, but on our agenda. We're going to stay true to our promises, Mr. Speaker, because we know, Mr. Speaker, we know, you'll have your turn, we you know, know, Mr. Speaker, that if the opposition had their way, we'd increase gas prices by 35 cents a litre, crippling small families in Ontario. Their members said that, that lowering gas prices was reckless, Mr. Speaker, was reckless. Ask the member for Niagara Falls to withdraw. I withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. the opposition, you have to stand up and withdraw. Thank you. Yes. We have a few more seconds to request. Please put your question. Can the minister let us know how this government will make Ontario competitive while recognizing the challenges of no climate change? Minister. Stop the clock. Hear your point of order after question period. Minister, respond. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for the question. Um, 
it's quite clear where this side of the, the legislature stands, but the NDP, you just never know. Yesterday, the NDP member from Timmins held a press conference. He was introducing what he calls the Fairness in Petroleum Products Act, advocating for stricter rules protecting consumers from higher gas prices. Now, while this may or may not be a good idea, yesterday in this House, Mr. Speaker, NDP members stood and spoke in opposition to actually reducing wow. gas prices, wow. reducing gas prices by four and a half cents a litre and four and a half, or five and a half cents for diesel fuel. So in contrast, Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear. We have said what we will do, not empty promises. Here, here, here. Next question. Restart the clock. The member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Canadian democracy is built on a foundation of laws and customs. Since Confederation, Ontario has developed customs and common practices that have led to a more meaningful and robust democracy. The vindictive actions taken by this Conservative government towards the people of Toronto violates a long-standing custom to not interfere in local government elections. The government's actions are nothing short of an affront to our democracy. Why has this government so willfully violated our democratic institutions for political gain? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, through you to the member. We're taking a decisive action, Speaker, so that on October 22nd, the people of Toronto will have a streamlined council that can make those quick decisions, but in the best interest of taxpayers. Local government, as I've said many times, delivers very critical services. But I have to say to the member that, that bigger councils are not necessarily better councils. Again, it should come to no surprise to the member that we're looking at having a more efficient and more effective government. Uh, my officials are working with uh, uh, the uh, staff at the City of Toronto to deal with uh, the changing of the nomination dates that's included to the bill to uh, from uh, July 27th uh, to September 14th, Response. I want to assure uh, the member and uh, this House that the elections will continue on October 22nd. We're working with the City of Toronto. We're working with. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Minister. Even children in elementary school learning about government for the first time understand that free and fair elections are a cornerstone of any democracy. But this government seems to be struggling with that concept. It is anti-democratic to cancel elections. It is anti-democratic to alter elections while they're in full swing. And it is anti-democratic to do all of this without consulting anyone. The fact that only certain municipalities that the Premier has a personal grudge against are targeted by these anti-democratic democratic moves is even more chilling. Why is protecting the Premier's ego more important than upholding democratic institutions that he is supposed to protect? Minister. Again, Speaker, through you to the member. Uh, our party and our leader, our Premier, was, was very clear during the election. Crystal clear. We talked every day of the campaign about respecting taxpayers' dollars, about reducing the size and cost of government. I want to again remind the member that a bigger council doesn't mean it's a better council. And I believe quite strongly that having a system where you have that one electoral boundary, where you're able to look at a constituent and say there's one MP, there's one MPP, and there's one city Best council. Sure. October 22nd, there will be an election in the city of Toronto. It will provide a more streamlined council that can make those quick decisions, but very important decisions. I think it's going to be a better council. It's going to be a better decision-making process. This bill will result in better local government. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore.
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Today, the federal government has finally come to terms with the ineffectiveness of their planned carbon tax. This tax, as we have said, is detrimental to the Canadian economy and does not have the best interest of Canadian businesses in mind. If passed, the federal government's revision of their carbon tax will reduce what Canadian businesses will have to pay by 10 per cent. Minister, through the Speaker, how will this revision of the federal carbon tax aid Canadian businesses and bolster the broader Canadian economy while providing relief for Ontario families? The environment, conservation, and parks. And Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for, for her question. Uh, this government was elected on a mandate to put people first and make life more affordable for families in Ontario. This includes our commitment to scap, crap the scap and tra, cra, scrap the cap and trade <laughs> carbon tax, which is in the process of doing with Bill 4. Um, our promise was clear, but as the member also mentioned, and this was uh, news to all of us uh, this morning, following a series of closed-door meetings between industry officials and the federal government, the federal government has signaled a reduction in their planned carbon tax. Huge. Now, the fact, Mr. Speaker, of this climb down by the federal government is a signal that we have been right all along. While I'm pleased to see that the Prime Minister has started to acknowledge the severe economic impacts of a job-killing carbon tax, I'll continue to say, and this government will continue to say, that we oppose a carbon tax in any form and are in any size. If the federal government continues to pursue a carbon tax to punish Ontario families and make Ontario businesses uncompetitive, we will oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm happy to see that uh, Justin Trudeau woke up this morning and smelled the coffee. <laughs> I'm happy that he realized the negative effects on this tax on the economy, Canadian businesses, and Canadian families. The reduced tax means businesses will have fewer costs to pass along to consumers and face less competitive pressure. Automakers are already facing difficulty in maintaining jobs and investment in Canada and cannot afford sharply higher carbon taxes. I'm proud to say that our government is keeping our promises and moving past the previous Liberal government's obsession with raising taxes, and instead we're creating an opportunity to usher in a new era of economically prudent, effective environmental action that will protect Ontario families. Minister, through the Speaker, my question is, why do you think Mr. Trudeau and the Liberals rolled back their carbon tax question. heating? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Clearly, the federal Liberal Party and Mr. Trudeau are starting to hear the message from Ontario employers, from businesses across Canada, saying that a carbon tax will make them less competitive. Um, it's also perhaps a coincidence that an Ipsos poll released just a few weeks ago found that 72 per cent of Canadians thought that a carbon tax was nothing more than a cash grab. That's why we're committed to using all the tools available that we have all the tools in the courts and all the tools we have to oppose the federal government's carbon tax. We did not fight a campaign to eliminate cap and trade just to have a job-killing carbon tax imposed. Mr. Speaker, the end the carbon tax era in Ontario is over. Promise made, promise kept. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. A speaker, this uh, Premier has cut local government in half and calls it more representation. The Premier ends environmental protections and calls it conservation. And this government acts cruelly and calls it compassion. You know, Mr. Speaker, I've heard the minister twice this morning say that they are going to be hitting the pause button. It's quite a callous comment because people cannot hit the pause button on their lives. And in fact, I would suggest that it's actually a rewind button taking this province back decades. So my question, Mr. Premier, is given that the decision announced yesterday to end the basic income pilot before any evidence is in can only be seen as punitive. So why, without any evidence, is this Conservative government Question. ending the basic income pilot project. 
Minister of Children, Community and Social Thank you, Honourable Member, for her question. And I, I understand it will be difficult for her because one of her communities, uh, her community is impacted. Um, first, I just I want to say thanks to the, the people who took that leap of faith and joined the project. I know it took a lot of courage for people to do that, and I will commit that we will take a thoughtful and responsible approach as we wind down. But let me talk a little bit about the research. I have a ministry. I have bureaucrats and I have staff that are monitoring this, and, I'm be, I, and I am told that this program isn't working. It's, it's actually disincentivizing people from, be, from, from working. It's disincentivizing them from, uh, from, from lifting themselves up. So um, I appreciate the member opposite's uh, question, um, but our project research team will continue to be in place to support participants in the study. We'll have more to say on how we're going to, uh, to wind this program down, but I also want them to know that, that their payments will still be Response. on time for the month of August, and I assure them that if they have any questions, I would be happy to take them as minister responsible for this area. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, through you to the minister, one of the country's most respected fiscal conservatives, Hugh Siegel, who I've had the pleasure of speaking with, recommended this particular form the pilot would take. So I presume that Mr. Siegel is not in the back room of Ford's hard right conservatives. So since this pilot started, there's been testimonials from researchers around the world. It has gone global. Again, once again, I'm going to remind the members that you refer to uh, other individual members in the third person, and uh, you talk about their writing name or their uh, parliamentary name. I apologize, Mr. Please, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, so let me just quote some of the participants that are from my ha riding of Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas. Uh, a woman said, I don't feel so backed into a corner. If I want to eat, I can afford to buy something instead of going to a food bank. And that's from Wendy Moore. I also would like to quote Tom Cooper, who's the director of Question. Hamilton's Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, who said, I am angry on behalf of the Hamiltonians who were promised they could participate in this pilot project, and they were sold a bill of goods by the Ford government. Thank you. Response. Thanks very much, Speaker. Look, I will, I will say this. Uh, the constant labelling by the opposition is not helpful to this debate. This is a very sensitive area. We had to hit the pause button because we inherited a disjointed, fragmented social assistance and poverty reduction strategy. These aren't easy decisions, but they are the right ones for the better outcomes for the future of Ontarians and in order to make sure that they're more sustainable. So I, I would urge the member opposite, um, if she would like to have a conversation with me, to sit down and we will talk about how we can best get her, her residents back on track as we get out of this uh, basic income um, research project. But I assure the member opposite that when we take our time in the next 100 days to outline a plan for the people of Ontario, there will be less people going to food banks, there will be more people getting back to work, and there will be more Lots. people having a sense of optimism in the province of Ontario after 15 years of reckless Liberal spending and planning. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The next question, member from Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, this, my question is for the Minister of uh, Infrastructure. After 15 long years of self-serving Liberal administration, the people of Ontario finally have a PC government led by Premier Doug Ford, which is committing to bring prosperity and opportunity back to the province. Gary. You're here. Yesterday, it was reported that Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs enter into a planned development agreement to move forward with developing a high-tech neighbourhood with a people-first approach. That means well-paying jobs, affordable housing and urban innovation. Can the Minister please share with the House what this neighbourhood of the future will look like? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, from Markham Unionville for the uh, great question here this morning. Mr. Speaker, our government is pleased that Sidewalk Labs, an associate company of Google, has partnered with Waterfront Toronto to deliver modern, innovative infrastructure for the province of Ontario. Sidewalk Labs will be investing $50 million to help create a master innovation and development plan for Keyside, which will prioritize sustainability affordability, mobility, and economic opportunities. 
Further innovations will include data-driven processes to ensure energy efficiency and improved noise, traffic, and pollution. Mr. Speaker, other areas for development and research will include high-speed internet, machine learning, and self-driving cars. Speaker, this is cutting-edge innovation that's going to likely lead uh, to 5,000 new private sector jobs being created uh, here in Toronto and in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is open for business. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Thank you for the great update. This development will certainly help send the signal that Ontario is open for business here, here. for all sectors and industries. Attracting a prominent company like Google to invest right here in Toronto is a sign of good things to come. I'm sure the rest of the world will be looking to Ontario to see the steps we are taking to promote innovations and sustainability in mixed-use neighbourhood. Can the minister Tell this House how this investment fits into the broader vision of the province and what economy benefit it offers. Thank you. Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the uh, excellent follow-up question. Mr. Speaker, with great investments like this, it is no wonder that Toronto and Ontario continually rank as one of the top high-tech centres in the entire world. The potential long-term economic benefits of moving forward with this specific development could include 5,000 new jobs, innovative solutions to urban issues, and fresh investments totaling billions and billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. It delivers on this government and our Premier's commitment to attracting knowledge-based capital and investments to Ontario, and we're going to continue to create and support high-paying jobs in the private sector and innovation in new high-tech sectors. Our message that Ontario is open for business will ring loud and clear. Mr. Speaker, this new agreement is another way that our government is fulfilling our commitment to the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, promise made, promise kept. Okay. Restart the clock. Next question, member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. 22 school boards across Ontario are standing up against this government's dangerous decision to force the 1998 sexual education curriculum back into Ontario's classrooms. From Durham to Simcoe County to Ottawa Carleton, they've said in no uncertain terms that their priority will always be maintaining an inclusive and safe environment for their students. Whereas this government, wherever this government fails to protect Ontario kids, Mr. Speaker, these school boards will stand in. Now this government is, in, is creating more chaos by demanding Toronto boards shift their boundaries by August 14th, or this government's going to impose them on them. Why are Ontario school boards showing more leadership to the children of Ontario than this government? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to address this because we need to ensure that the proper message gets out, and that is we're keeping a campaign promise to respect parents because from the last administration, we heard time and again that parents were totally left out in the field and not respected with regards to their feelings and their position on what was being taught in terms of the health and physical education curriculum. So our position is very clear. The teachers are going to be using the curriculum that was last used in 2014, 2014. and we are going to be ensuring that every school board, every parent, every student, every person who wants to have their voice heard will be consulted and we invite the member opposite to participate in the forum that will be kicking off this fall. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education refuses again to stand up for the students of this province. While this minister refuses to show leadership, we have chaos in our school boards. School is back in just a few weeks. We have a deputy premier who's been flipping and flopping on this, saying that if a child has a question not covered in the irrelevant 1998, you can call it 2014, it's the 1998 curriculum, say like cyberbullying or gender identity or consent, teachers should take them behind closed doors in private and talk directly to that child. Yeah, that couldn't possibly go wrong. Why does this government think it's appropriate for children to shoulder the responsibility of accepting an inclusive and relevant education? Do they see how this will further endanger our students? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, Speaker, I have to tell you, I absolutely reject the spin that that member opposite is trying to generate. Absolutely reject it. We are moving forward with a very thoughtful, comprehensive consultation that is going to move the health and physical education curriculum forward. And I look forward to kicking off this consultation this fall. And again, Part Speaker, I invite uh, every single member in this House to be part of the solution because we know the last Liberal administration totally disrespected parents. And we're going to put our best foot forward to ensure that we respect people throughout this province and make sure that we have a curriculum that meets Pause. the needs and addresses social issues in a respectful way. Thank you very much. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. First, I would like to congratulate the minister on his re-election and appointment as minister. I know his experience in agriculture, both in politics and the field, will serve him well in this role. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there are many great agriculture products available across my riding of Carleton, including fruits, vegetables, honey, lamb, beef, chicken, eggs, and dairy. Thanks to a private member's bill put forward by the minister when he was in opposition, I see many signs showing where Ontario-grown produce is available as I travel to events across Carleton. This Saturday is Food Day Canada, an excellent opportunity to celebrate our agriculture industry and enjoy the great local food produced by our hard-working Ontario farmers. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what can Ontarians do to celebrate Food Day Canada in their communities and show our farmers how much they appreciate everything they do? Mr. Agriculture, Food and thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for her question and congratulate her as well on her election. I know she will serve the constituents of Carleton well. I also want to thank the residents of the Great Riding of Oxford for once again electing me to serve on their behalf here at Queen's Park. Here in Ontario, we have a strong agriculture, agri-food industry that produces many delicious products for consumers to enjoy. I encourage everyone to celebrate Food Day Canada and support our Ontario farmers, producers, by looking for local food options. Our farmers and processors work hard every day to ensure consumers have access to high-quality and healthy food, and our government supports the agriculture industry. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is open for business, and our agriculture industry is no different. Our government supports the agriculture sector, and I look forward to working with the agriculture community to reduce, reduce red tape and strengthen our agriculture industry. All right. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister. Ontario is open for business, and I commend the minister for the work he has done to promote local food and produce in Ontario throughout his time in the legislature. I look forward to enjoying Food Day Canada this weekend with some delicious local food from producers in my riding, including Carlton Mushroom, Suntech Tomatoes, Rideau Pines Farm, and Shouldice Berry Farms. It was great to hear from the minister about how Ontarians can engage in Food Day Canada on Saturday. And I was encouraged to hear that the minister is working with the agriculture sector to strengthen the industry. 
Mr. Speaker, through you, uh, Minister, what else is your ministry doing to support our agriculture industry and our hardworking Ontario farmers that put fresh local food on our tables? Thank you very much again, Mr. Speaker, for the, and the member for the question. It's been a very busy first month as Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. During my first week as minister, I held an agriculture roundtable with representatives from many Ontario's agriculture organizations and heard directly from the industry about the challenges they face. I was able to attend the Federal Provincial Territorial Meeting of Agriculture Ministers, where I was proud to represent our government and share the interest of Ontario's agriculture industry with my counterparts from across the country and discuss how we can create more jobs and support economic growth in agriculture and the agri-food sector. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to continuing working with the agriculture community to support Ontario's farmers, rural communities and, and agribusinesses. Our government campaigned on a promise to support our farmers, and that's exactly what we're doing. Promises made, promises kept. <laughs> I want to thank the members for their cooperation in, in helping the speaker uh, ensure a more civil discussion this morning. Question period. Member for Timmins on a point of order. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, on a point of order, and it's exactly to that point, it's pretty clear with this uh, new Premier administration, the temperature of the House and the tone of the House is very much changed. I want to refer Listen, I, I point out the Premier is not here today. Order. It's the most best behaved you've seen in a long time. You, the member knows. The member knows he can't refer. To, the member knows full well he can't refer to the absence of another member. What's your point of order? My point is, under Standing Order 23, there is two parts of the Standing Order that are pretty topical to what happened this morning with the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, and that is, first of all, you can't allege anything against another member, right? Number one under H, but K, but, but K, order. But understanding order K, use abusive or insulting language of a nature likely to create disorder. It was pretty clear what the member was trying to do. Order. I ask that you keep members in order. You did a pretty good job today, but I think members have to be on their guard. When we'll come to order. Member for Carleton will come to order. I'd ask the member for Carleton to withdraw. I withdraw. Yeah, I would remind all members that inflammatory language is not helpful, and it doesn't raise the tone of debate. It doesn't enhance the respect to the public, anybody who's watching, anybody who's visiting, anybody who's paying attention. We need to raise the bar, and intemperate language is not helpful. And the member's quite right. There are standing orders which prohibit ac accusations against other members. Uh, the Speaker is not in a position to be able to judge the merits of any of the accusations, but I would ask all members to, to refrain from doing that. It is uh, time now to recess the House. The House will resume this afternoon at 3 p.m.